Hello, Ethan. It is your girl, the legit of boss, Sasha Banks. The Wrestling Life. Hey, everybody. It's The Wrestling Life, episode 302. It is sometime in May 2022. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. And we say this every week, but in this case... I don't know that we've ever had so much more to talk about. <laughs> and as always, so many things we can't talk about. Like what we can't talk about is, is to, is, so we're recording this on May the 19th with yes, haha, funny cane, terrible angle. Yes. Uh, but also is today the anniversary of Randy Savage's death. I don't know or this. I think it's this week if it's not today. I know it was the anniversary of his getting married again in 2010. Okay. I thought he died in May of 2011. That is... He died May 20th, 2011. Okay, so there so you go. So by the time most people are listening to this, most of the listener are listening to this, it will be the anniversary of Randy Savage's death. So that's an example of things we won't be talking about this week. Exactly. Well, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we were both in attendance for different live New Japan shows this week. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a dynamite that's built into the pay-per-view and all that. And yeah, uh, that's pretty much it, right? What, uh, nothing really going on in the Fed this week, huh? No, no. It's not like, you know, the heir apparent of the company <laughs> walked out on the company or... <laughs> Plus, Stephanie McMahon left. Hey, <laughs> or or two wrestlers walked out due to creative differences with the company. Mm-hmm. All right, we'll start it there. Sasha Banks and Naomi walked out on Monday Night Raw because they didn't like what was scripted for them to do, and apparently they felt disrespected as tag team champions. They placed their title belts on Johnny Ace's desk <laughs> and left the building. And if you believe wrestling media, no one is on their side. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do not believe the wrestling media because I've seen wrestlers tweet support for them. Yeah, um, I think maybe that was a little bit premature to say that if, if you were someone on say Monday evening or Tuesday, even Tuesday afternoon, who was saying that Um, that's clearly not the case, both in and out of the company. Quite a few people. I, you know, I don't follow every wrestler under the sun either. And I saw quite a few. So now I'm sure there are many people. And I think even the reports that have been more favorable to Sasha and Naomi, which at this point would be like the fightful version of events, and the uh, even honestly, the Sports Illustrated one was one of the nicer ones, <laughs> one of the nicer write ups too, um, which were people that were like, well, we sympathize with the frustration part of it and the standing up for yourself part of it. But walking out during the show is where people were drawing the line. And then, yes, there are some people that just flat out, regardless, think they did the right thing. So. You know, wrestling, no, nowhere in the world, including in inside of a wrestling company with the employees and quote unquote independent contractors who work there. It's not a monolith. So I think it's a little short sighted if you're claiming that everyone thinks a certain way in that company. So the crux of the matter is that Naomi was supposed to win. Sasha, she may or may not have been going to pin Sasha. They... I really don't think this is about doing jobs at all because who cares about doing jobs? And I really don't think anyone cares about doing jobs. But uh, Naomi was then going to lose to the Raw Women's Champion, Bianca Belair, at the next pay-per-view, Hell in a Cell. Sasha Banks is going to go on to do a program with Ronda Rousey and lose to Ronda Rousey. And they would not be defending the tag team titles until the Money in the Bank show which would also probably mean no money in the bank match for those two, by the way. Uh, Naomi may have been trying to negotiate a new contract, 
lot of factors going on here. There is a lot of, um, well, how can you be such a mark for yourself and the fake tag team titles that you're going to walk out of your on your job? To which I would say, of all the stances to take, <laughs> of all the things to side with Vincent Kennedy McMahon on, his terrible booking is <laughs> where you're going to draw the line. It's like we've heard for years that the problem is this guy is so out of touch and there's no good booking from bad booking anymore and yada yada. And then someone stands up to his booking and they're demonized for it. Look, man, I got, yes, maybe people who walked out took themselves too seriously. Maybe people who walked out um, got a big head. At the same time, it's about time somebody stood up to the uh, the dictatorship there. Well, yeah. But I One, I just have this feeling, and I don't, I don't know that this has been reported. Other than that, we do know that there is apparently an element of Naomi negotiating a new deal. Um, I yes. don't feel like Monday is the only issue those two have had. Sure. Um, I think there are unconfirmed reports about, you know, what maybe they were promised originally for WrestleMania before being told they were going to be put in the tag team. Yes. And that they were, you know, once they were told that they tried to make a go of it and, and really wanted to be in a position, not for the first time, by the way, that Sasha has been placed in a tag team and told that you're winning the tag titles and we're going to give you a chance to make these belts mean something. <laughs> um, so I, I can imagine there's a lot to it on the Naomi side. You remember, uh, it's a long time ago now. It's like in January. Um, do you remember when they did like an eight week storyline where they just made Naomi look like the biggest loser every single week on SmackDown and had Sonya Deville make her look like an idiot every week? I mean, that story went on for like six months, but yes. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. So that was like, that was the whole storyline was Naomi showed up one week at TV and said, why am I not booked? And they made that a storyline. So, or, or this, that was the storyline, which I assumed was maybe pulled from real life. Naomi, perhaps suggesting that she was unhappy with her lack of utilization on the show. So they made that the story. Um, so I don't feel like we know what led up to this. And yes, if you look at it in a, a very small bubble of, okay, you're going to, is this the worst creative decision that WWE has made like in the last month? Probably not. <laughs> but like, again, like you said, it's a, it's a mounting thing. And there is that thing of, well, the tag belts don't mean anything. It's a bigger deal for you to wrestle the singles champions. Well, they don't mean anything because nobody nobody tries to make them mean anything. So maybe like there's an argument, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where you go, well, why do you care so much about these tag belts that nobody cares about? And I guess there's, there is that edge and there's a way to be a bit more cynical or, or realistic. If you want to, if you want to use that word instead and say that if you are, if you work for that company and you are um, under <laughs> some sort of, misunderstanding th about what is going to happen and how you are likely to be booked in that company, especially as a tag team and as a tag team champion, that maybe you are, uh, maybe this is what you should expect. And the fact that all they're asking you to do is do jobs for the champions, for the singles champions one at a time and not, Hey, it's not two of you losing to one champion at least. Uh, you can make that argument and say that, hey, this this is way down the list of the most terrible ways that WWE has booked tag team champions over the last decade. And it's probably, again, probably true. But I just, the whole, this whole week I have felt, and we won't hear it until the people involved choose to uh, address it directly. But until we know what led up to that day, it doesn't, we're not, I feel like we're just running in circles here and 
people being willing to make sweeping generalizations about people being marks for themselves or that this was an isolated insulin and, and they walked out for this alone. Also, there is another little side thing that I think you mentioned to me off the air. Um, Sasha Banks wrestled Ronda Rousey in 2019 and got injured. So we're, maybe she didn't want to wrestle Ronda Rousey. <laughs> maybe that's part of it too. It's not, oh, and again, and that might, it might be a lot of this. It might be, hey, we were promised that we would be given a chance to make these tag titles mean something. And hey, I don't feel like this is a good use of me. And also, I, it's not about losing, because hey, Sasha and Naomi have done jobs on television in the last month to yes. multiple people. Maybe yes. it's like, I don't want to do a job to her. Maybe that's part of it too. Like, I don't know. And we're not going to know until if and when the people directly involved choose to speak on it. Yes. How about three years ago, I wrestled Rhonda and she separated my shoulder. <laughs> and almost made me miss WrestleMania. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She separated my shoulder, which I then kayfabe so that I could work WrestleMania and introduce the tag team belts. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. A lot of layers to this. And maybe that's the part of, you know, WWE. It's worth noting that WWE got very mad about this. And had, <laughs> they released an absolutely insane statement <laughs> during Raw where they called Sasha and Naomi unprofessional and they detailed everything and they had Vince McMahon feeding Corey Graves lines on commentary about how they summarily and unprofessionally <laughs> left the building. I was waiting for a notwithstanding. That was that's my favorite Vinceism. <laughs> and we didn't get that in Corey's verbiage. Yes. But aside from that, very funny how mad WWE got about this. <laughs> to me, Baby that's mad. as good of a reason to do it as anything. <laughs> <laughs> like if just just to make them lose their minds, they like as we talk again, we talked about this a little bit off the air. People have noted this all week. Yes, eventually the CM Punk stuff got very, very ugly. They sued him. He claimed they almost killed him. Like it got very ugly. But yes, they didn't bury him on the air the night he walked out. And according yes. to Punk, like two weeks later, Vince called him and just was like, hey, you ready to come back to work, pal? So <laughs> the fact that they were, and I guess leaving when the show was on the air seems to be a real sticking point for again, where the dividing line was for a lot of people. Um, so maybe that's why, because yes, this side of, not since Steve Austin in 2002, have we seen <laughs> such a, I guess, other than like that Ultimate Warrior DVD they did. Like I've never seen them just that publicly angry and vindictive about anybody on a live television show. Yes. It's fascinating times. Well, the chief brand officer of WWE is taking a leave of absence. Stephanie McMahon is stepping away from the company. And Nick Khan is assuming her duties. <laughs> you know? He's added another Infinity Stone. Yes. You know, WrestleMania Week, you're pointing out to me that uh, Stephanie McMahon was not wearing a wedding ring. Mm-hmm. You're pointing out to me that when Triple H did his retirement speech, he or it wasn't a speech it was just a putting his boots in the ring mm-hmm. uh, he hugged his daughters and not his wife mm-hmm. huh just things that make you go hmm and i said i said <laughs> i said people at stephanie and hunter's level don't get divorced look at vince and linda for goodness sake mm-hmm. it's pretty widely accepted that they have not been together for about a decade or more and yet obviously they don't get divorced because it's just just wouldn't be done whether it's some issue of we're not splitting up the the money or it's it's just better for optics if we stay together i didn't think that people at stephanie and hunter's level would get divorced and i'm not saying that they're getting divorced now (laughs) I'm just saying there's enough, there's more smoke 
to what the fire that you pointed out several months ago. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to say there are older photos of Stephanie McMahon making public appearances where she did wear a wedding ring. So at the very least, <laughs> she changed her fashion choices within the last year or two. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's probably it's maybe it's nothing, but it's also pretty strange that, you know, Stephanie's been involved in that company for a very long time. And yes, for the last couple of years, she hasn't been really directly involved on the television side of things, but she's still been sort of the, the public face of the company and her stepping away from that. And, and uh, Vince's new son, Nick Khan, taking over that space as well. It's like, wow, this is, uh, you talk about, uh, I think the phrase is consolidating power. <laughs> And I just want to point out again, uh, Nick Khan, very good friends with, with Dwayne Johnson. Yep. So maybe Dwayne got the last laugh on, on Hunter and, uh, and maybe Vince for doubting his, uh, his Hollywood prospects after all. Yep. Definitely feels like a story. Uh, Stephanie stepping away. Maybe it's just as simple as, hey, my husband almost died nine Mm -hmm. months nine months ago and i need some time maybe that's maybe that's it Mm -hmm. could be maybe it's not maybe it's not (laughs) i just i like i just can't imagine what like that 24 hours (laughs) were that to come true would be i don't want to over exaggerate here or just exaggerate because that's the same thing uh but that would be like the best day of my life. (laughs) That would be a really funny 24 hours. Well, there's plenty of time for reckless speculation about this (laughs) at a later date, I'm sure. That's right. That's right. Uh, They did some stuff to build the hell in a cell. (laughs) Cody Cody and Seth are going to wrestle inside a cell, even though Cody has won the first two matches of their trilogy clean. He will, well, I guess he held the tights in the second match, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, they're doing Hell in a Cell because that's just what they do. And um, Bianca Belair will be wrestling Asuka on that show. We'll see if they add, find a way to add Becky to make it a three way, which is what I thought they were going to do all along. Mm-hmm. And uh, and yeah, and Roman Reigns is uh, is not working that show. Yeah, I guess obviously when. Most people hear the SmackDown won't have happened yet. So uh, they said they're unifying the tag titles on SmackDown this week. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I don't expect that match to have a real finish. I mean, you could do a non finish there and then do a cell match for the for the unified tag belt. I suppose. I suppose. If they <laughs> want to unify the tag belts, which based on the last seven or so weeks of WWE television kind of feels like they don't want to, even though they keep saying they're gonna. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Um, yeah. So all the off the off screen stuff, far more interesting this week in WWE than, uh, than the product itself. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. Really, really has been the case for the last 20 years. <laughs> oh, uh, one, one final WWE note before we yeah. move on. Yeah. Uh, I saw that in NXT vignette with the girl who said she's still in high school. Yes. Everyone who watched that show should be in jail. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Look, man, if it's, it's not, my... if it's not your job. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Let me, let me give a clarifying statement. If it is not your job to watch that show and report on what happens in it, you should be in jail. Not, not arguing with you. It's 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 a show for perverts by perverts. <laughs> a lot of bad wrestling on it. This week's NXT, I will say, is the most palatable episode since Dolph Ziggler before Dolph Ziggler showed up. Oof. <laughs> a low bar, but hey, it was not particularly good, but it was less actively terrible. <laughs> So there's that. Speaking of actively terrible, 
AEW Dynamite this week. <laughs> I don't know. I just like giving them a hard time. Well, and we we discussed this off the air. Uh, you you have professional reasons that this show irks you in a way that it probably doesn't to me or your average uh, Dynamite watcher. Sure. Like, so they they've already announced the top match for that pay per view, and so they think that the 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 whole pay per view is going to be sold on that, and then like. The rest in their minds, you know, the undercards, the undercard, undercards don't sell pay-per-views. And so they do, they shot two angles on Dynamite where they set up a match with Jericho's crew against Regal's crew in some kind of no rules thing. And I can't even remember the other match at this point. Uh, um, the, the three-way for the tag belts. Right. With Jungle Boy and the Luchasaurus defending against Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland and Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs who are teamed for reasons. Um, so they, they, they did challenges and stuff for those matches on Dynamite, but they never officially announced that the matches were going to happen. And it's like, you could say what you want about the World Wrestling Federation, where anything can happen. But <laughs> at the end of those segments, at worst, at the start, by the start of the next segment, they would have shown a graphic for the match on television. They would have tweeted out a graphic for the match. And they would have had Michael Cole screaming at you that a week from Sunday, these matches will be taking place. <laughs> AEW didn't do that. So then I have to acknowledge that, the, that they shot these angles. But when you're trying to write a news article about it and you're saying what do you say? It's like they shot some angles. These matches certainly appear to be set to happen, but they never officially said that they're going to happen. It's like they're just very, they need one person who makes $75,000 a year that can be their, like their continuity person mm -hmm. and can, can post graphics for matches on social media, have them ready to go and post them on social media after the, the angles take place. It's really not that difficult. It could be one person's job. Mm -hmm. You get a 22-year-old kid and pay them $65,000 a year to do it. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> All right. I volunteer. All right. Hey, tweet Tony Khan. He might... <laughs> <laughs> he likes to take suggestions from the fans. He's a good, he's a good, he's a good guy. He likes got those moving graphics that people lose their minds over. Yes, His fan was like, "Hey, let's get moving graphics, Tony." And someone did a mock-up. So, perhaps if I suggest that he pay me seventy-five thousand dollars a year to make graphics for his matches and tweet them after his segments, uh, perhaps that will also work. Look, if graphic design is your passion, <laughs> you can't be worse than the person that they have do the graphics for Rampage and Dynamite every week. Sure, yeah, it's, it's impossible to be that bad. I'd be like Tony for the same price. I'll just run your. I'll run the social media too. Like, yep. Like, like I won't tweet out at Johnny Gargano is here when uh, Johnny Mundo <laughs> walks out. Yes, <laughs> I won't do that. Yes, I'll only tweet the wrestler who is actually there. Is there? Yes. Yeah, they did that this week and then deleted the tweet. Uh, Johnny Gargano is not there, by the way. No, and I don't think he's going to be there anytime soon. Uh, He's doing Starcast or something in uh, July, so maybe I think uh, he's about to be out out here a little bit. But mm -hmm. yeah, he's done a few. I know he's done like a few smaller autograph signings and stuff. I think he did a. I don't know if he's done one of those high high spots virtual ones yet or not. But um, I know he's been doing some appearances, and then yeah, he'll be doing Starcast. So yeah, maybe maybe in the fall it'll be uh, it'll be time for for Aunt Candace. I'm sorry, Mom Candace and. Uh, and Johnny to uh, to make their next move. Yeah, I did. This is there's no way to do this. without sounding like Jeremy Ross. Candace did post a photo of herself on social media the other day. And it's like she's got 33 abs already. So <laughs> it's already back in shape. Mm -hmm. It's good for her. Uh, aside from my pet peeves and nitpicks about Dynamite, uh, people seem to like the program. <laughs> and uh, there were two jokers on the show. Maki Ito, who may in fact actually be a Joker, and 
Johnny Mar John Morrison, Johnny Drip Drip, Johnny Impact, Johnny Elite was the men's joker. Tony really didn't pump these up as major surprises or anything. And so I think people kind of accepted that they were a little bit underwhelming and they haven't signed either person yet from my understanding. So, Mm -hmm. well, I guess if you're going to do this and then, but you want to have your current people beat the, (laughs) the surprise debuts, you want it, you want it to be people that the people watching the show have heard of or seen before, but also not someone that they'll be furious. Like if you brought Cesaro out there or even, I don't know how people would have felt if Britt Baker beat Athena or Mia Yim or someone like that. Yeah. But if you did that, <laughs> there might be a little bit more up, people upset. Whereas if you beat a guy who's like John, Johnny, the <laughs> Johnny elite feels like a guy. Yeah. You would bring that guy in and he would, he would lose. <laughs> Because you're like, hey, it's this guy from it's the guy from the other show. And then he shows up for a week. You're like, all right, that was cool. Nice little cameo. And then and then we move on. Yeah, totally fine. Um, yeah, my my big thing is uh, like 18 months I have been asking to put something with the Young Bucks and Sting and Darby together. Yes. <laughs> and looks like again, no match made official some less than two weeks from, <laughs> from their pay-per-view now. Um but uh, it looks like it's an eight man. It's uh, Sting, Darby, and the Hardys against the Bucks and Red Dragon at the pay per view. So that sounds neat. That'll be fun. Yeah, I, I don't think they're going to announce because K- Cole Kyle still has a chance to. He's still mm-hmm. alive in that tournament. That's right. Okay. Yes, yeah, so they gotta they gotta wait one more week to uh, do it because that was my other thing too. Is uh, if you watch PTE. Um, which I they, no longer do, thank God. Ah, oh, poor you. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's uh, they they've really hit the the Hardys and Bucks stuff hard on that show. Yes. Um, but they haven't announced it or really done much on television at all, other than having them stare at each other at the Baltimore show a couple of weeks ago that we were at. So it didn't feel like again. If you're building up, I know that match has happened before in Ring of Honor and other places. But uh, I still feel like you, if you were doing just the regular Hardys versus Bucks tag match a week from Sunday, I feel like you'd be hitting that a lot harder. So the fact that they're waiting to the last minute, other than that, just that's just kind of how they do their television. I think I have to assume it's an eight man and you raise a good point that they are probably waiting until Kyle loses to Samoa Joe in the semifinal to, to set that up. So that makes a Samoa Joe Adam Cole final uh, for the men's Owen Hart tournament. More Uh, like the Triple H Memorial Tournament, am I right? Well, there you go. I mean, Adam Cole has been the most pushed wrestler in AEW since he showed up. (laughs) As far as total television time and amount of time that the announcer spent talking about a wrestler, even when he's not on screen, 100% it's Adam Cole. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So it'll be curious to see if if Adam wins that match. I think we'll I, I figured he would, and uh, probably you can can have uh, Satnam Singh and his little friends uh, yeah. cost Joe the match, and then I just assumed Adam Adam Cole and Britt are winning those are winning those those trophies, and that's your inaugural. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's weird to have heels win the first one, but both of those acts are basically babyface acts anyway, so. Yeah, I don't think people will mind. Prom king and queen. Mm-hmm. Yes, wonderful. Uh, any other AEW stuff you want to talk about? No, I think that's. Oh, oh, Serena Deeb, worst promo of the year, I think. You see, now there's going to be a segment of people that are like, you, you complain all the time about there's never any stories, or there's one story at a time in the women's division, mm-hmm. and they try to put a story behind Serena Deeb and Thunder Rosa by having Serena Deep talk about how she got implants and shaped her head to because old perverts ran her old, her old wrestling company. And, uh, and they finally gave them a story and now you're not uh, happy with the story that they gave you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's certainly going to be, I think, a talking point. I, like, I just thought her delivery was bad. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Maybe worst promo of the year is a little harsh because, like, I don't know, Ron, Ronda Rousey's on television on SmackDown every week. But, you know, and again, not to be flippant about this, but, like, Ronda does have, like, a bit more of a reason why she's not a tremendous public speaker. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And maybe some people aren't just natural speakers and i i thought the promo that serena and thunder rosa did in baltimore the other week that we we saw was all right i didn't think it was particularly good but yes by you brought her out you have her heel on tony Chavani and then heel on dustin Rhodes, and yes she hits this line about how her career was controlled by perverts um uh oh just as an aside uh uh she 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 lives with marty squirrel um but anyway uh yeah i just i didn't think it was an effective segment and then it felt a little bit rushed at the end with rosa running out and then she's trying to look at dustin so that she doesn't see uh serena grab the belt but she dropped the belt right in front of her so serena has to grab it and thunder rosa has to pretend to not see her grabbing the belt (laughs) Uh, it was a bad segment, so you know, I a for effort maybe. Um, I'm sure some of that content came from the heart, but swing and a miss, not not good. A lot it, of their a lot of their angles and promos, I feel like we're seeing the rehearsal as the as the final product. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe there's maybe there's the reason why we sh- we could have a, a writer <laughs> work for the show. Like, I'm not saying you script every word of every person's mouth. Maybe a lot of people don't need that at all, but maybe a little bit more strict uh, scripting, for lack of a better term, would help people, as, as a matter of fact, and would be a useful tool to have someone or perhaps a staff of people <laughs> Uh, that you could go to if you needed help. If you're like, hey, I got to talk on live television tonight. This is kind of what I want to say. Can we go over something? And can you guys help me figure out a way to say that uh, in a way that is compelling and and makes sense? Maybe that would be good. I don't know. Just just throwing out some ideas. The weirdest part of the segment to me was definitely that they had to cuck both Dustin Rhodes and Tony (laughs) Schiavone in the segment. It's like this is very this is a very WWE way to try to get heat mm-hmm. to take the two old guys and uh, try to uh, try to use them for heat. Yeah, like it's one of those things on paper. The idea that Serena is mad because she doesn't get her flowers for being a a someone that helps pave the way. She had to come up in this cutthroat, terrible world of of 2005 OBW or whatever which i'm sure was terrible <laughs> don't get yes. me wrong uh and okay thunder rosa and people like her wouldn't be where they are and women's wrestling wouldn't be where it is if there weren't people like you know serena deeb coming along first and 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 and, and all that like there's nothing wrong with that or that's not a bad story it was 100 percent the execution and then yes as you mentioned those little uh, accoutrements of of <laughs> uh, ha- trying to get the crowd into it more by having her just be mean to Tony Schiavone and, and Dustin and them having to kind of just stand there impotently and look sad. <laughs> um, yeah, very, very WWE in that way, which is funny because, again, the whole promo was about how she suffered while she was in WWE. But Yeah. All right, we both went to different New Japan shows. I went to the Saturday night pay per view. You went to the Sunday afternoon television taping. I think I got the better end of the deal. <laughs> well, you got Okada, so you like already won. Yeah, I thought they were going to add Okada to Philly, but I guess he was just came in for one show. Doesn't it's work the B Towns, brother. That's right. I mean, they made poor Tanahashi who. <laughs> held together with duct tape <laughs> wrestled two nights in a row you know what watching him live amazing obviously uh, yes. but like I was watching him and you know what I realized is like if you watch if you ever watch AAA and like 
one of the 50 year olds is out there. Yeah. And not one of the hardcore ones, like one of the guys who still does like Lucha. Yes. They'll, they'll do a move. They'll do it kind of in slow motion and then they'll stop and they'll raise their arms and the crowd will go. Yay. And that's <laughs> like, that was, he had a match with Chris Dickinson, uh, the very recently problematic Chris Dickinson. Um, and uh, during, during the match, it was like, he would, he got a, he would get cheered. And if he was doing the moves and people kept cheering, he would, he would kind of try to move on to the next thing. But if people had kind of started to die down, he would hit like the twist and shout or he hit the, the second rope crossbody or whatever. And then he would go, he would raise his arms and look at the crowd and the crowd would go, yay. <laughs> and it was just like the way that he was just constantly, it's like, if you look at what he actually did, he did all right. of his signature stuff. He did the, the second rope senton, did the twist and shout and the dragon screw and the, uh, he did the, the crossbody and the, uh, laying down a uh, high fly flow, which I wasn't sure we would get both. So, uh, sure. Like he gave you all of the, the Tanahashi experience that you would want. And the rest of it was either he was selling or he was just like, he would just stop and he'd be working a hold or something. And then he would look at the crowd and, <laughs> and the crowd would go crazy for it. So just the way that he worked the crowd. I mean, it's not, we've talked about that for a while now, but despite his being held together with, <laughs> with ice and duct tape and, and gum at this point, I think he's, uh, he could still just, he and Suzuki both, what a gig for those guys to just come over here after two years of all clap crowds and they can do a 10th of what maybe they would, they would do on a, on a Japan show or in their prime and just be the most over guys on the show. Yep. Yep. Pretty great. I uh, I love that uh, pay per view show. Uh, tight three hours in and out. Good matches. Nothing overstated. It's welcome. The big matches left you wanting more. The only thing that was weird was that they kind of they both Tanahashi and Okada were both like carried to the back. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, but you gotta get heat, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Good times, good times, good times. My only, um, yeah, my only other yeah. thought there was there's definitely guys that you see them live and you're like, oh, I get this. I get it a little bit more now than uh, we've talked about Jeff Cobb improving, but I thought he was he was pretty impressive on the show. Uh, he wrestled Willie Mack and had a very good match. And then uh, Great Khan, who I kind of like is like this wacky character. <laughs> But I didn't really think of him a lot as like on the actual wrestling side of things. Yes. And they did a, a 10 man tag with him and some of the other United Empire guys. And it's like, oh, this guy's super charismatic. And then to t- on top of that, during the intermission for the show, I was walking out uh, and kind of just meandering my friend that I went to, I think it was in the bathroom. I'm just kind of standing there and I look and I see a man with no shirt in gym shorts carrying a rolling suitcase that has a braided ponytail down to his back. And I was like, Oh, that's the great Okan. He's just walking. And then he went to like this, there's like a little lounge area. This was in the old ECW arena. And he, uh, he takes the rolling suitcase. He puts it on this pool table that is next to the bar and he just opens it up, starts going through it. (laughs) Just, just trying to sort out his life. Uh, in the middle of the day. I was like, this is the <laughs> darndest thing I've ever seen. But I definitely came out of that show going, God, Great, Great O'Conn's kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah, rules. <laughs> there's, a, there's a charisma, I think, that he has that maybe doesn't come through on uh, on on the television screens or if you're only seeing him in, in the tags on on shows, on the, on the undercard of shows. People react to him, and uh, he he sent me a message earlier. Like, this is ha- he's just wandering around with a shirt off, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if he's if he's going through something or he's just trying to sort through his life in public. And then later, there were you were sending me photos with of him taking photos with fans while this is happening. It's like I guess he was just out there vibing. You said <laughs> that's right. It's a deeply strange fellow. Mm-hmm. But uh but he was uh he's big over, so good for him. Mm-hmm. All right, so those are NJPW live shows. 
um, it's kind of some potpourri hodgepodge stuff as we uh, head towards the finish here. Ric Flair is going to wrestle another match. Ricky Steamboat has declined to take part in that match. <laughs> Ric Flair is going to team with FTR against the Rock and Roll Express and someone that they could find who wouldn't mind being in the ring if someone passes away in the ring. Joey Janela, right? I can't see that <laughs> happening. I mean, he definitely wouldn't care. <laughs> I just like I just I just feel like okay, so you have Ric Flair teaming with youngish guys, the youngish tag team, the current day tag team. Yeah. And then and then you're they're wrestling uh, the tag team of yesteryear, so it should be like a more modern single star fandango it should be fandango why not you need somebody that can carry the match and it's like the way that they were laying that out it's like you're well you're either counting on ricky morton or ricky steamboat <laughs> mm-hmm. to, to do the bulk of the work in the match and it's like well oof. like ricky morton's still pretty good for being 64 or whatever but he's 64 mm-hmm. and ricky steamboat was great 12 years ago, but he was 57 then and he's 69 now. It's mm. like, mm, mm, yeah, so they're still looking, I think, for uh, for someone that can carry the match on the baby face side there. Yeah, it's just look, let's just be honest. <laughs> A lot of people are going to watch the show and you can try to market it as like a Clint Eastwood movie. And it's the the old gunslinger coming back out for one last fight. That's not what this is. People are going to watch the show. People are going to buy a ticket to see this show because they want to see if the old man dies or hurts himself really bad. It's we're all we're going to pay our nickel to look to look at the freak show like that's what this is. And anybody involved in this that is telling themselves any different is either uh, fooling themselves or is a liar or both maybe. Both, perhaps. Yeah, it's going to be promoted by um, his son-in-law. Oh, oh, so not. Oh, good. I was, I was worried like a carny uh, shyster might be involved, but good. It's just Conrad. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> tell you what. Maybe I can tell the story. I was. Um, no one listens to this show. I can tell the story. <laughs> I was talking with Renee Paquette about doing a podcast. I talked to her on over the phone or over Zoom. Everything was all set. I was like, I want to find a podcast ad guy who is not connected to Conrad because there's just something about him that I don't trust. So I thought I found someone who was a wrestling podcast ad guy who could sell ads for me because look, I can go door to door and, and cold call and cold email people and ask for ads, ask for commercial money. Uh, but it's not, it's not what I'm good at and it's not the best use of my time. So I want to find somebody to do this for me. I find a guy, talk to him on the phone and uh, turns out he was Conrad's guy. And they were really excited not to be talking to me. They were really excited at potentially getting their hooks into Renee. Mm -hmm. They're like, they're like, we want to set up a thing where we have Renee sit down with Conrad and, you know, do some publicity and things like this, things like this. Anyway, Mm -hmm. the pot, the podcast with Renee, at least for the time being fell through, Mm -hmm. but um, the ad guy from the podcast heat network, which is connected to Conrad, they were going to take 35% of what they sold. Seems pretty high to me. Yeah. Now, 65% of nothing is better than nothing. <laughs> I mean, you know, 65% of something is better than n- Nothing, 100% of nothing, I think is what I'm trying to say here. But <laughs> at the same time, 35% seems pretty steep to me. Sure does. Anyway, 
we may still revisit that podcast at some point, but uh, it's not happening anytime soon. So Frasier Observer Radio will only live in the bonus features <laughs> of this show for the time being. <laughs> sure. All right. Um, what else is happening here? Oh, the authors of Pain, who are crypto bros, have set up a money laundering operation disguised as a wrestling company that is going to have Alistair Overeem and all of the 2020 WWE releases on the roster. A lot of people making big money on a show and the commentary team are the drama king guy and <laughs> the coach. Uh, yeah, I look, I, you know how I don't advocate for, uh, for being a stan of a promotion. Oh, like, you're a big, no corporation guy. Yes. yes. Uh, but I will make an exception for this show because I mean, you're giving me Alistair Overeen in a pro wrestling match and you're giving me CJ Perry versus whatever Nia Jax's real name is. <laughs> What else? What else could a could a fan of pro wrestling want in, in 2022 than Alistair Overeem versus Braun Strowman and and Lana versus Nia Jax? This is this is this is going to be big, and it's not ridiculous how much they're charging for uh, tickets for that show. Yes, yes. Is that are those prices more insane or the WWE? Uh... <laughs> prices for cardiff more insane uh good question i think probably wwe it's at least worth a shot because you can always discount things later because people have still heard of wwe (laughs) and might pay to watch wwe if you cut those prices if you cut a third of the price off of off of what they were charging uh people might uh, still be willing to pay that even if they were previously turned off by the high prices. Uh, whereas who would pay more than like $12 to, right. uh, to watch like Fandango wrestle Lindsay Dorado or, or Lana and, and Nia Jax. Like <laughs> the money is in this weird, like revival of pro wrestling zero one MMA guys doing wrestling matches for some reason stuff so if they get more uh more you know 2008 ufc heavyweights on the show maybe maybe we maybe we're in business here but as of now this this seems uh, quite outlandish so the pre-show match for this thing are fandango versus no way jose ah yes and mike bennett versus biff Busick. <laughs> all right <laughs> mike bennett can't even make the main card <laughs> No, <laughs> on a money money laundering show. <laughs> Mojo Raleigh's wrestling Lindsay Dorado. Ah, sorry, Mojo on Lindsay. Yes. Yep. Um, Madison Rain and uh, Tennille Dashwood are wrestling Diana Perazzo and Chelsea Green. It's like the closest thing to a real match yet. Mm-hmm. Um, Killer Cross is wrestling Callisto and Jonah in a three way. That's kind of a real match, I guess. Sure. Call- Callisto, who got himself. <laughs> blackballed from AEW <laughs> after one appearance. Mm-hmm. The authors of Pain are wrestling uh, Wesley Blake and Steve Cutler. Sure, why not? Uh, yeah, then uh, Nia Jax and Lana are wrestling, and then uh, Braun Strowman is wrestling Alistair Overy. Mm. <laughs> sure, why not? What a show. By the way, just one last harken back to the New Japan topic, because you mentioned Jonah. Uh I talked about guys who like uh, impressed me live, um, like like uh, like Great O'Con or Hikaleo. I thought was very impressive just for the size. Mm. Like mm. that's a big sucker. Like especially because they they did mm. a ten man and he was standing next to Gallows. I was yeah. like, this is, a, this is a big fella. <laughs> so like it's impressive in that way. In a in a look in the the airport test, you know, sort of way. Sure. Yeah. He didn't do a lot in the match that impressed me, but. Okay. Um, but I just want to say I, I saw Jonah and no offense to him because I think he's a good worker and everything but I watched him and I was like oh this is a little fella <laughs> he's <laughs> he's why he's why and I'm like I mean I'm not I'm not I'm not the big show here I'm I'm a, somewhere between 5'10 and 6 foot tall <laughs> and I'm you know three, 370 or so let's say so I'm like this guy is wider than me 
and he's shorter than me. And I was like, oh, this is why. This is why you're not in WWE. <laughs> this is why they they took one look at you on the main roster and went, nah, <laughs> nah, we're good. He's a little fella. <laughs> he's a little fella. That's that's my thought when he came out. I was like, oh wow, he is he is a little little guy. <laughs> Hikaleo is shockingly clumsy, was my takeaway from seeing Hikaleo <laughs> live. Like, well, of course he's clumsy. He's seven feet tall. <laughs> right. By the time he thinks about what he wants to do, by the time that gets down to the muscles in his legs, it's it's been hours because of how, how tall he is. Yes. It's like, oh, he's not the worst big guy I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. He's better than a lot of big guys, but he's just, he kind of has two left feet. You know? For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, was, as as a, an aside, in this aside, I was just ah oh, Jonah. He's a he's a he's a wee little short guy. Yep. Um, another thing that probably would have fit better in WWE or AEW talk, but this story came out today that, uh, um, but I definitely wanted to touch on because it it checks a lot of boxes as far as things that that I like to talk about. Uh, Tony Storm <laughs> said today that uh, in, in an interview that she didn't mind when Charlotte threw pies on her because the original idea for the angle was Charlotte was going to rip her shirt off and leave her like in her underwear. Um, uh, uh, embarrassed or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So they did one like body shaming thing, but originally they were going to do a different potentially body shaming thing to Tony Storm. Yes, one that was theoretically perhaps a bit more physically violating to her. Yes. I wonder well, how many stories there are like that of like, you think what they put on television is bad. <laughs> you should have seen what the first pitch was. Like I was thinking about that. I was thinking about when Moxley first left and he was he did the podcast where he said there was one thing that was so heinous that they wanted him to say about Roman's cancer that he wouldn't even repeat it on the air. Yes. I was like, so how many more stories do you think from people that are there? People that are top stars, even in that company that are like, boy, if you think that segment was rough, you should hear what they pitched the first time. Yep. Tony showed up on uh, dynamite this week. Looking like um, like she just stepped off the set of like the television show Dallas in the nineteen eighties <laughs> or something. Like I, I mean, she looked like a television star from the nineteen eighties. And mm-hmm. uh, Jim Ross, who just signed an eighteen month contract extension with AEW, by the way, <laughs> says, "Man, how great does Tony Storm look?" It's like. <laughs> We all have eyeballs, old man. Keep it in your pants. <laughs> He's just excited because it looks like how attractive women looked back when he could still get. Never mind. Uh... <laughs> before he needed a blue chip. Yeah. Before he, he, he related to her look because she looked like every woman on television from 1978 to 1988. Yes, correct. That is what happened. That's what we endure when we watch AEW. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Every thought that comes into Peepaw's head. <laughs> Just stream of consciousness. Yep. We got 18 more months of it, at least. Look forward to that. Uh-huh. You know, they just threw food on me. It could have been so much worse. They could have torn my clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why do we have to? throw food on you or or tear your clothes off (laughs) just just a just a bad like (laughs) look (laughs) all wrestling companies are bad (laughs) that one (laughs) yeah oh boy they just they're they are on one uh especially if they are booking a woman who they don't think is conventionally attractive by the standards of a couple of 75 year old men who are in charge of everything that happens in the company. Yeah. Yeah. It's really something else. It's, it's, it's really something else. Uh, every third show, there's a woman in the ring barefoot 
and <laughs> like every other week on NXT, they're throwing some kind of food substance on a woman. It's like there's definitely some fetishes in that company, and they involve women being barefoot and food being thrown on women. It's just really like I know there are foot guys, but <laughs> are there people? Are there food on people, guys? <laughs> in that company, apparently. So. <laughs> there must be, because it happens all the time. It anyway. does, yeah. All right, well. The show has again reached a new low. <laughs> Once again, I, I fear I've said too much. <laughs> I think I may not have said enough in this case, but I'm going <laughs> to just move on. I'm going to exercise better judgment and not say anything else about Tony Storm. All right. Uh, anything else you want to get into? No, I think we have covered quite quite a lot of topics, and we've been uh, talking for a long time. Yeah, we sure have. But again, as you said at the top of the show, I don't know that there's ever been a week where we had more to talk about. That's true. And at least we kicked it off by talking about whatever thing from the eighties you were trying to talk about. I'm not sure. The why. death, the death <laughs> of Randy Savage. I was trying to take us back just to 2011. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to swear. Alright. So, Alright. Alright. Till next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. <laughs> I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the rest of your life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. <laughs> Do you ever, do you ever find that like, you ever like ironically start saying a word and then you just say it all the time and you don't even notice you do it anymore? Has that ever happened to you? Gonna, gonna need an example here. Uh, me saying the word anywho. Uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, I think it started because I was, it's something that um, surely on community says a lot. And, uh, and so I would say it somewhat ironically. And then I realized a like maybe a month ago. Oh, I just say that word. I don't say the word anyway anymore. I say the word anywho all the time. And I can't stop. <laughs> it's, a bit of, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, not specifically with a word, no. But I, uh, I, as part of a bit, I started calling this television show 24, the 24. <laughs> <laughs> and then Someone was like, you, kn- you know, the name of the show is just 24, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm doing a bit. <laughs> oh, it's that. Uh, it's, uh, la- it's like saying, pronouncing it Lady Gaga. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that kinda, that's sort of my default way or- of pronouncing it thanks to you as well. So. Yes, or saying you've lost your balance. <laughs> That's probably my current one. Yeah. Oh, I, I lost my balance. Oh, you lost your balance. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just I realized that. I was like, oh no, I think I, I think I was doing a bit at one point, but now it's just a thing I do. Yes. The <laughs> the file name is Hello Ethan. <laughs> you were gonna say something about the Orioles before I started oh, doing shit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, no. That's I was like, they won today. It, they did. I it was a uh, six to five uh, in the eighth when I turned it on, and then Jorge Lopez blew the save. Mm-hmm. And it was six to six, and then I fell asleep, and then I woke up and saw if they won nine to six. Mm-hmm. Santander hit one over the the new left field fence. Wow. Yeah. You know, not seeing many of them. I mean, you're not seeing many home runs at all. And you won't until after the all-star break when they fix the balls without ever <laughs> acknowledging that they uh, did anything to them in the first place. Like that year, the opposite thing was happening. Right. I, th- I think they may have fixed the balls like last week. Okay. <laughs> so they got it. They got it a little bit out, out in front of it. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, somebody was claiming like, well, that's just the humidors because as the weather gets warmer, the humidors that are in every stadium now, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I think 
I think they, I think they did something to the balls <laughs> <laughs> last week. <laughs> I just love that policy of like there's just effing with those <laughs> with those baseballs every year, and then they pretend that they don't know what's going on. <laughs> right. But... They they bought the baseball company. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That manufactures the baseballs. And we're like, look, we're just as confused about this as you are. <laughs> Could be any number of a thousand things. <laughs> yeah. See. I'm trying to catch up on the news day here while we're yakking. Johnny Depp trial. That's a freak show. It's still going on. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's like, I hate to Tony Khan it. Yes. I think there are bots involved in the amount of Johnny Depp support the fervent weird yes like constant trending of like of hashtags and the swarming of every video clip of that yes trial does not seem uh authentic i buy it but i have no proof of this oh somebody accused elon musk of exposing himself a proposition in her for sex oh that's cool <laughs> Send that guy to jail. That'd be neat. I mean, it, he won't. Nothing will happen. But you he's know, too, he's too rich for anything to happen to him. No, yes. no, no. Yeah, he's he's fine. But yes. uh, hey, it'll make him big mad, which is uh, is the only solace we get for people that rich and powerful. Yeah, and he. Um... Is probably not buying Twitter, so there's that. <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on.